Welcome everyone to Carlo College St. Patrick's for this lecture celebrating International Women's Day. My name is Dr. Thomas McGrath, and on behalf of Carlo College, a third level college of the arts, humanities, and social studies here in the center of town, it is my pleasure, in the center of Carlo Town, it is my pleasure to introduce today's public lecture, which is being given on the subject of fighting oppression and injustice. In recognition of the oppressed people of Ukraine and International Women's Day, we're going to raise the Ukrainian flag and a flag for International Women's Day in the grounds of Carlo College at the end of this lecture. Our lecturer today is Stephanie McDowell, who is Program Director of the BA Honours in Social, Political and Community Studies in Carlo College and a lecturer in Community Development here. Today, she is going to argue that to bring about positive change, it is necessary to understand oppression and what it means to be oppressed. She will contend that oppression and injustice can be fought through allyship. We are once again very glad that so many of you have joined us today on this, our latest live streamed lecture. We're very pleased to be joined by schools, not just from here in Carlow and surrounding counties, but from all over Ireland, and by people in various parts of the world. Our lecturer will speak for about 45 minutes, allowing 15 minutes for questions. I will put questions from the floor to Stephanie at the end of her lecture. So without further ado, it is over to Stephanie McDermott for today's lecture. Thank you, Tom. So, as, as Tom has said, my name is Stephanie McDermott. I teach here at Carlo College. Um, and tomorrow is International Women's Day. So, every year, Carlo College marks International Women's Day in, in some way or other. So, this year is part of the public lecture series. So, what I'm going to talk about today is oppression um, and how we can fight oppression through allyship, which is uh, a way of working and a way of standing in solidarity with people who may feel oppressed or indeed are oppressed. Um, and that that is just not women, but also it can be men, it can be minority groups, it can be religious groups, it can be people perhaps with disabilities, it can be children, it can be so many people because we, we all we can all go through a time in our lives where we feel oppressed and feeling oppressed is perhaps we're not listened to or perhaps um, we are disregarded for one reason or another. So I'm going to go through all of that today. Um, and I, I, I'll start off as I usually start off in these situations where um, I give definitions. So we, we're all on the same starting point. We're, we all have a reference point, if you like. So what is oppression? It occurs whenever one person exercises authority or power in an unfair, subtle, sometimes not so subtle, but very often subtle, cruel or needless controlling way. Um, oppression lowers self-esteem, knocks confidence, limits its capacity and reduces life opportunities which can ultimately place people in an inferior position so that again you know if you're constantly oppressed if you're constantly told that you're not good enough or you're constantly dismissed or it is it, it can become internalized so from a very early age if you're from a family of both boys and girls and the boys seem to get be favored over the girls that can cause internalized oppression where you accept that it becomes very much internalized and that is defined as the involuntary belief of myths and stereotypes about girls and women and men and boys that are delivered to everyone in society and are taken as as true and thus then it becomes normalized okay so i'll continue there so for example internalized oppression and i suppose i wanted to focus on internalized oppression a little bit because we all know we all know what oppression is, you know, where people feel that they just are not comfortable in themselves. They feel held back for one reason or another. So internalized oppression. So for example, both men and women are brought up to believe in subtle and not so subtle ways that women are passive, manipulative, 
and have limited capacity for leadership positions, this becomes internalized, okay? So we, can, we know we've reached a place in Irish society now and in, in some parts of Western society where we have acknowledged that at least. I'm not saying that we, we are, we have reached a place where there is equality, but at least we have acknowledged that there was a time in Irish society where women were second-class citizens, and in some communities, women still are second-class citizens. And we have to acknowledge that. So a woman who does not speak up in work, me in work meetings because she feels her contributions are not as important or uh, are, are incorrect in comparison to those of her male counterparts, this is internalized oppression. So very often, internalized oppression it just it's it's kind of the building blocks of disempowerment so for instance if a woman it can happen if a woman decides okay i'm going to say something at this meeting and that's dismissed the person who is holding the meeting has silenced that woman probably for the next four or five meetings because they have been dismissed you know, so a good chair or a good facilitator will ensure that everyone's voice is heard at that meeting. And if that means throwing out a question and that means afterwards, well, nobody answered, then if that is the pattern, then it's important perhaps to break up the meeting into like you two go off there and speak, come back with an answer, you two go off. So everybody gets that opportunity. And that again, is about a, a facilitator's way to make sure that every voice is heard. So because of internalized oppression, women may feel they have to work twice as hard to be valued, gain, gain, and to say to gain the same recognition and pay as their male counterparts, and that is often the case as well. So I'm going to look at the sites of oppression now. So there are many ways that people feel oppressed. So we have the isms, um, and they're an important introduction to the countless ways that people are oppressed through the following. So of course we have racism. We all know what racism is. It is discriminatory behavior or thoughts because of someone's ethnicity. And of course on March 21st, every year, we have International Day Against Racism. We have sexism, which I'll be focusing on today because it's International Day um, um, Women's International Day tomorrow. We have sizeism, where people are often discriminated on because of their size. We have classism, depending on the class you're from, and the accent you have, perhaps the geographical position that you're, you're living in. And of course, we have ageism, which we know is felt by many people in society, both men and women. Now, there, that's only... Um, a few of the isms, there are so many isms, but the, these are the ones that we talk about quite a lot. So isms, they form clusters, and a cluster is a way of thinking or an ideology. So if we talk about sexism, we come from an understanding of what it is, that we are discriminating in thought and indeed on the basis of someone's gender, okay? So conscious and unconscious ways of discriminating and excluding. Now, we're aware sometimes of the conscious ways, we may not give much thought to them, but the unconscious ways, sometimes we are not aware. And it's, that is um, conscious bias and unconscious bias. And very often, it is the unconscious bias that we have to be concerned about because we actually don't know we're doing it. We are so used to doing it, or so used to going and sitting with the same people that it might be to the exclusion of, exclusion of other people. And we don't, we don't think about how how that may feel for somebody else, or we may, as lecturers, always ask the same people for the answer. You know, so we have to be very, very, very conscious of how we, uh, how we use bias. So sexism. So sexism is an oppressive and especially a discriminatory attitude or belief towards women. Okay, when power and prejudice is used to oppress. So prejudice is some is it's prejudging, if you like, equates to the negative ideas that we hold about a certain group to the benefit of another group for whom we conversely hold positive ideas by definition. Okay, so if we are holding negative ideas about a particular gender we're obviously holding positive ideas about the opposite gender. So we're going to keep it on gender lines today. So power 
in the equation means the way that these ideas are upheld, normalized, reinforced, and maintained by the structures, legislation, and of course, what we're calling for is more legislation, and that's really important, policies and institutions across society. So it's really about an examination of society where sexism is rife. And we know that we try very, very hard to acknowledge that and to work to negate all of that. But of course, what what we need to remember is that for many of us, um, when we, we witness something that is sexist, that often triggers something in us because that has been the treatment of our mothers, of our aunts, of different people in society. So, you know, people might say, oh, you're far too sensitive. But what they're not, what they're not understanding is that is a trigger for what has gone before. And that's, that's why we all need to be really careful about where things that we say, where they land, because sometimes, you know, they can land in places that is a trigger for people uh, in terms of how they were oppressed or their mothers or their grandmothers or even their friends. Okay, so I'm going to look at intersectionality theory. So we look at sexism, but that's only one site of oppression. Okay, sexism is only one site of oppression. So intersectionality theory suggest that people are often disadvantaged by multiple sources of oppression. So their ethnicity, their class, their gender, gender identity, their sexual orientation, perhaps their religion, and other identity markers. So it's not just one site of oppression. And in the Athena Swan, which Carlo College have now, they have the bronze medal for, we look at intersectionality because we cannot look at one site of oppression ever, because very often these sites of oppression, they overlap. So intersectionality recognizes that identity markers, for instance, woman and traveler, do not exist independently of each other, and that each informs the others, often creating a complex convergence of oppression. So there we go, the intersectionality and how that works. So we have abilities or disability, uh, people may have challenges in certain ways of working, gender, race, ethnicity, class, nationality, and that is, again, becomes overlapping social identities. And for sometimes it's for women that these overlapping social identities become very, very acute. That's not to dismiss, and we're not talking about men per se, we're looking at International Women's Day and we're looking at how women can be oppressed and the different sites of oppression, and that's what's really important. So the intersectionality lens, and a lot of places are adopting an intersectionality lens. It's almost, it's like a gender proofing. So anyone who has children will have um, child proof their kitchens or their rooms where children don't get hurt, okay? So it's the same with a, um, an intersectionality lens, gender proofing, that we have to gender proof decisions that are made. How does that affect women? So any decision that is made, it needs to be asked, how does that decision affect women? How does that affect women perhaps with a disability? So if we have meetings upstairs, four flights of stairs, how does that affect women? Are, are we enabling everyone to be at that table? So we need to gender proof it all of the time. So they're interdependent and that's really important, they're interdependent. So we've gone from looking at independent sites of oppression to interdependent sites of oppression of systems of discrimination and disadvantage. So without an intersectional lens, our efforts to tackle inequalities and injustices are limited. If oppression is not examined by this lens, we are likely to just end up perpetuating systems of inequalities, okay? So again, it's doing nothing is not enough. People have to do something, they have to examine. So interne intersectionality is a vital framework for understanding systems of power. And this is Jensen here. If we don't acknowledge it, we can't dismantle it. And that is, if, if you take anything away, that's what you need to take away today. Because if we're not saying that it's there, we can't go about dismantling it. Okay, so if we don't acknowledge it, we can't dismantle it. And I'll, I'll move on from that and I'll, I'll see, I'll examine how that works. So identity and oppression, okay? 
So our markers of identity, we all, we all have multiple identities, you know, whether that's student, female, whether it's mother, whether it's worker, whether it's driver, whatever it is. So our markers of identity can indicate the level of oppression we experience, okay? So a white man who is poor with limited choice and opportunity may feel oppressed because of his lack of power and control in his life. And he has every right to if he has limited choice, um, if he's poor. A white woman with a similar profile may have an added dimension of oppression because of her gender. So if you want to put those two, the white man and the white woman, let's add another dimension. They're both homeless, okay? So the white woman or the woman is in a, a different position than the man in terms of her gender because of the fact that she's a woman and she's open to more dangers on the street. Okay, so a migrant woman with limited English living in a patriarchal community, so ruled by the father, ruled by the man, no financial independence, no extended family support will require support to ease the oppression she is experiencing. And of course, she may not even feel she's oppressed because it is normalized in her community. But if you're looking in, you can see that that might be a site of oppression there. Okay, so we look here, we look at the comfort zone. So we all have a comfort zone where we feel, you know, quite happy. I, I, well, I, I don't want to say happy per se, but comfortable. It's we're in our comfort zone. So in order to grow, and I'm sure you can all think of times in your life that you experience something that it caused growth, it caused personal growth, which, you know, is really transformative to have that opportunity to have that personal growth. So to overcome oppression, we all need to act in the pursuit of justice and liberation and become allies, okay? So through allyship, and I would equate allyship with solidarity. So through allyship and solidarity, we become aware of how people are oppressed and what we can do to act as allies and act collectively to create a fairer and more equal society, okay? So there is a continuum which I look at here. So allyship is when a person who has the ability and capacity acts in solidarity and in partnership with an individual or a marginalized group of people to help take down the system that challenge the absence of rights, equal access and ability to thrive in our society. And really it's all about questioning the status quo. And that's really, really important. It's about questioning the status quo. So allies act out of genuine interest in challenging larger oppressive powers system. So people who stand in solidarity with those who are oppressed, with their friends who are oppressed, um, people in the community who are oppressed, or they feel, you know, oppression is, it's, oppression is quite a strong word. It's like hate. It's a really strong word. But there, it, it, it's also a spectrum. Oppression is also a spectrum. So we may feel oppressed one day by an encounter, and we may not feel oppressed for the next 40 days, you know, or in a certain stage in our lives, we may feel oppressed. So ally, what it is, is it's an active, consistent, arduous practice of unlearning and re-evaluating in which a person holding power and privilege seeks to end oppression by acting in solidarity with a group of people who are oppressed and ultimately disempowered, okay? So I, I just wanna go back to, to the unlearning and re-evaluating. So very often what we have learned through our upbringing, whether that is, you know, where there are both boys and girls in a family, but it is um, a given that the boy will inherit the farm. Or it's a given that the, the boy and will perhaps be sent off to university and perhaps not the same opportunities. Now this is, of course, this what, what I am talking about here is how Irish society has evolved. That doesn't mean that that practice has not stopped in terms of inheritance, for instance, you know, and people would talk about, well, there's very good reasons for the men to inherit the land. Um, but that often feels very disempowering to perhaps a sister who might be older or younger. So it is about this questioning again, that wh where is the fairness in that? You know, how can you come to an agreement where you feel that there is fairness in that? And that can feel oppressive. So, 
and ultimately disempowered, okay? So it's about standing in solidarity. So perhaps a brother or an uncle or whatever might say, look, great, I'm going to inherit this 200 acre farm, but you know what? I need to give something to whoever's not inheriting, who is also equally, um, equally uh, should have something in terms of equality. So allyship, it is an individual's willingness to contribute to and actively participate in the struggle for justice and equality that renders them allies. Partners, comrades of this community, despite the fact that this person is not originally part of it. So a female can be an ally. You, you get it hard to see that there. Yeah, it's okay. A female can, can act as an ally to a male. A male can act as an ally to a female. So, for instance, I do quite a lot of work with the Rohingya community. I'm not a Rohingya, you know, but that, does, that doesn't mean that I cannot stand in solidarity with the Rohingya and perhaps advance their voice until such a time is that the Rohingya or travelers or any oppressed group um, can feel that they can do the talking for themselves. So we all have a little bit of leverage to do that. And people look at me sometimes and say, oh, I don't know where you get the time. We all have a little bit of time. We all have a little bit of time to use a little bit of leverage that we have, whether that is signing a petition or whether that is just turning up today, whether that is standing outside this afternoon when we're putting up the, the Ukrainian flag or the International Women's Day flag, that's allies, you know, that's, that's acting in solidarity. So we, we can all, we all have that capacity to do that. So oppression and disempowerment. So um, oppression leads to disempowerment. So people who feel oppressed by their gender, um, ethnicity, class, education, nationality will become disempowered, okay? So again, you know, we in Ireland might think that we are very advanced, you know, that we're working on equality, which we are, but we have to think of the millions and millions and billions of people in the world who are not there yet. You know, there's infanticide, there's, there's in terms of the, the global view, we have to understand that we need to perhaps, we might have got it to a place where we're happy, but that doesn't mean that our sisters and other people of other peoples of the world, they may need that solidarity and allyship to get at least a little bit, uh, make some progress in terms of their rights being realized. Disempowerment will eventually lead to lack of hope, fear, despair, and frustration, okay? And that's what it does. If you're completely disempowered, you know, you've lost it really, you know, you, you fear for the future, despair, and of course frustration that all of your efforts, they're, they're not coming to anything. An ally can stand in solidarity and give people hope. And that's, the, that's what really is important. So even if you're walking down the street and you see someone that perhaps, you know, is uh, that person might look as if they're um, not from Carlo or not from wherever the area is, you know, you might just nod and smile. That might mean a lot to that person because that person has come out onto the street, someone smiled, someone nodded in recognition, and they can go back and feel a little bit like I, I feel a little bit valued. I met someone who smiled at me instead of someone growling at me or saying, why don't you go home to your own country? Things like that. So really, really important that we all have that capacity and we all have that power to do that. So an ally will understand that people in powerless positions need emotional and physical support. OK, so it's not about judging. It's about supporting. And an ally will participate in the struggle for justice and equality. OK, so there we go. Recognition and acknowledgement of oppression, burdens and inequality is key. OK, so some people will will maybe laugh at this little, you know, this little um, representation of a man and a woman here and say, oh, that's not the way it is now at all. You know, and, and that, for for some families, perhaps that's not the way it is. But for many families, if we look at the evidence and we look at the statistics and we look at perhaps um, Susan Venn, you know, the fourth shift that, you know, the women, they have first, second, third and fourth shift. And the fourth shift is getting up in the middle of the night to feed the children. And then they're out to work the next day. And that does affect their ability because they're tired all of the time. And that's, that's very disempowering to feel that tiredness. And that can also lead to poor mental health, 
you know, not getting the best from yourself. So there we have the, I suppose, the stereotypical, and we don't like to stereotype, but this is the stereotypical view that this is perhaps what a woman has to carry, you know, children, shopping, cooking, and of course, working. And then you have perhaps uh, a, a partner, it can be male or female, who may just have perhaps one big responsibility, uh, and that is to, to work and to bring in most of the money. Um, because we all know that men, by by way of not taking maternity leave or taking time out that they can build up and of course their pension builds up as well so you know that's something again we have to examine so then allyship it's commitment to stand in solidarity okay so it's about again we go back to one of the earlier slide slides it's it's relearning really and it's reprogramming there ourselves you know and we ask the question you know, why is this so? So for instance, um, we could ask the question, and I, I've, I've thought about this a lot, where when men and boys and girls, men and women perhaps get married, uh, it is the norm for the father of the bride or the, you know, the uh, brother of the bride to give the daughter away. So up the aisle, here we go. And the girl, the daughter is handed over to the male. You know, and this is all, this, people may say, well, this is just tradition. Like we can't, we can't just be, you know, getting rid of tradition like that. But at the same time, while the female is being given away, she's also given away very often her identity in terms of her name. So she goes up as a Ms and comes down as a Mrs. So, you know, I'm married to Cormac, Cormac O'Sullivan, right? And I always knew that, that when Christmas cards came in and someone called me Mrs. Cormac O'Sullivan, I gave it to Cormac and I said, that's not from my family, you know? It can't be because they would know better than to call me Mrs. Cormac O'Sullivan. In fact, even if they called me Mrs. McDermott, because Mrs. is not a, 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 an identity that I would want to have, you know? And I have to question that, why is that so? But at the same time, it does put people in categories. The same with, you know, how many men, is it okay for them not to wear a wedding ring? But if it's a woman, why aren't you wearing your wedding ring? You know? Um, I remember I didn't, when we had our first child, I didn't wear a wedding ring. And I remember people saying to me, people might think you're a single mother because I didn't wear a wedding ring. And the scandal, imagine walking down the streets of Enniscorthy, people thinking I was a single mother, you know, terrible. So again, these are the things we have to question. And people might think, but sure, yeah, it is tradition. Sure, that's been the way it has been. But sure, if we look at that then, and things don't change at all, then women are not making any progress whatsoever, none. And of course, people will be other, you know, other, I, I spoke to my daughter about this. She says, well, at least we have the choice. She's engaged. So she said, well, I can take Connor's name if I want, or I might keep my name. And that's, you know, you can say that. But I, uh, what I, my argument would be, but that's internalized oppression. You know, you are, you're taking his name because you think you're going to be questioned. Like, why is his name not good enough? But then if we flip that and we say, okay, let the females what walk the females down the aisle okay and let the male take the female's name what then would there be outcry joe duffy would have a field day He'd probably keep them going for four days like these women these uppity women imagine so that's been the way it is why can't they leave things alone and of course that's always been the way women have always been criticized will you just leave things alone why are you so uppity things are fine as they are why are you upsetting everybody why are you giving them these ideas these fancy ideas of keeping your name or not wearing your wedding ring you know all of that so again you might laugh but it is you have to question, do you not question these things, you know? And I, I'm delighted now I'm at an age where I can easily question them because I don't care, you know? That's the liberation as well, you know, as you get older. So I do feel very, very, I do feel uneasy about young, young girls, for instance, 
okay? So the story is now with young girls. They might be seeing someone, okay? Um, and that's fine, they're seeing someone and they might be seeing someone on a, an ongoing basis, but they're not boyfriend and girlfriend until he asks her, will you be my girlfriend? So you think, well, where, where is the equality in that? You know, or a young man and young woman might decide together to get married, right? But he has to ask her, will you marry me? Even though they have decided to get married. So again, you have to look at these relations, these unequal relations, you know? So why is it that young girls in all of these years of feminism, all of these years of fighting for equality, feel that it is the man who makes the decision still in terms of where they're going in their relationship. That's internalized oppression. Because somehow young girls think, well, that's how it is. And you know what? Young men do not like bossy girls and they do not like needy girls. Mm -mm. Being a needy girlfriend, there's nothing worse, nothing worse than a needy girlfriend. So what young girls have to be is very independent, but they cannot suggest, will we go out together? Will we be a couple? But they can't be needy either. So that, that is difficult. So, you know, we've, we've moved on to different types of oppression in terms of, you know, young girls and young boys and how they relate to each other. You know, and don't get me started on what young girls have to wear when they're going out. Don't even get me started. All I can say is there must be many chisels at home at one o'clock in the morning to take that makeup off and fake tan and everything else. Um, I'm sure boys, they probably put a little bit of time into making themselves up going out. How many minutes do you think? Five, ten? You know, a little bit of, uh, what's the latest spray? Uh, what's that African one they, what is it called? Lynx. Lynx. Yeah, lynx, that's what it is, lynx, lynx, lynx. But I don't know if many men are getting the old fake tan out, getting the eyebrows done, getting the nails done, spending 60, 70, 80, 100 euro to look a certain way, you know? So this is what I'm, I'm talking about in terms of people might not link that to oppression, but if women are forced into acting a certain way, that's oppression, okay? So you stand in solidarity. So being an ally is about being aware of our own privilege and power and taking action together with women to end violence and create a more equal society that values and respects women. And I just want to say something here about the values and respects women. Um, we have what's called, you know, microaggressions, okay? So very often, you know, we have the major aggressions, which of course is violence against women, and that's a major, inexcusable um, oppression, you know, an inexcusable act. But if we peel that back, if we really peel that back, back to the sexist comments, did you see what she was wearing? Or, you know, oh, she's a, she's a girl. Or any of these, um, any of these, the wolf whistling, any of these uh, parts of behavior that it, it starts there, but it builds up and it becomes normalized. And that's how we have ended up very often um, in a society where if it's not called out in the school playground or not called out in the home or excused because boys will be boys and girls will be girls, then we're not going to move much, we're not going to move further ahead at all. So we have, we have to take it on board. So again, it's a society that values women and respects women. And of course we have an issue in Ireland, unfortunately, um, we have a legacy of disrespecting women. And it's very, very, you know, people can't get over that pain just in, you know, 20 or 30 years. It takes a long time because it's internalized. So we know what we did with women who did not uh, do what society expected them to do. We shut them away. We stigmatized them. Now, that's not that long ago. We're talking about, you know, the... 70s and 80s there. That's not that long ago at all. We can't just, you know, that just, 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 that doesn't just disappear overnight. You know, we hold that and it's there. 
And that's again, it can trigger something for women as well when, that, when they see or when they hear that um, a, perhaps a woman being put down or a woman being dismissed. So what do men do um, and women? So there's a men's development ne network. There's the white ribbon campaign in Ireland uh, where, where people pledge never to commit, condone, or remain silent about violence against women and gender-based violence. Now that's, again, the other end of the scale. But also what I would be committing to, that if we do hear sexist comments, we call them out. We just call them out. We say, well, that's not appropriate. You know, where do you think that's going to land? How do you think that girl feels by making that comment? Or if even if it's a male, perhaps, I mean, there's lots of comments, you know, people who are transitioning, people who are gay, um, all of these comments are set out to hurt and to minimize, to oppress, so that people can go back into their, into a place where they're not visible in society. And if we want to be an inclusive society, we've got to stop doing that. We've all got to stop doing that. So you make the pledge at mensnetwork.ie, the white ribbon campaign. So allyship can be a small action. You don't have to make a big grand gesture to be an ally. Anyone can be an ally and use their place, their place of privilege as leverage. So we all have some kind of privilege. All of us have some kind of privilege. An ally can enhance the culture of inclusion by engaging with their marginalized colleagues and providing support in their daily lived experiences, believing people in terms of what they are going through. When marginalized groups feel supported and included, they can make their way in from the margins. Um, thus creating a more inclusive environment for everyone. So what we don't want in a society is that people are, are out in the margins. What we want is we want the core strong. And in order for the core to be strong, we have to get people into that core. But of course, what we see happening, we see so many people marginalized. Um, so we see some women, we see migrants, we see refugees, we see people with disabilities. Uh, we see um, perhaps uh, people who are transitioning, um, all, all of these diff homelessness, we see all of this on the margin. So for us to make a stronger core of society, we need to, first of all, get people in from the margins, but also hear their voices, listen to them. How, you know, what, what can we do? What can we do to make people feel included? And that, of course, if we're listening to people and bringing people in from the margins, then we are a stronger society together rather than not listening and pushing people out. And we know that the more we push people out to the margins, the people in the margins, they're going to get together and cause trouble for the core. So it's, it's best if we can all work together. So there we go. I'm talking here about um, allyship. So we talk about little acts, you know, little acts. So a few years ago in Carlow College, we had a direct provision, um, indirect provision uh, conference. So, and it was great. We had people who came in from, from the margins, from direct provision centers, spoke of their experiences. It was a really useful, powerful site of learning for staff in Carlo College and for students in Carlo College. It was really, really powerful. So I can get up here and talk about what it's like to be an asylum seeker in a direct provision hostel, and that's fine, people will listen to me for a certain length of time. But if you hear people who are giving you their direct experience of what it's like, it will touch you much more. So that's, again, the importance of listening, really important. So there we go. We have two members of staff there from uh, Carlo College and who came into the conference um, and supported the conference and supported the ending to direct provision. And you know what? Direct provision, it has been signed that it is, is, it is ending. It has ended. Now, we haven't yet transitioned to independent accommodation. That's another issue. But because we all worked really, really hard to end direct provision and signed petitions and went to our local politicians, we got there. So that's what I'm talking about, the importance, the real importance. So this was on uh, Saturday last where um, there was an International Women's Day rally and these are women from Pave Point and Anastasia Crickley is there. Um, and again, you know, 
again, we know that so many travelers feel oppressed and we know why they feel oppressed. So it's about standing. It's about standing with travelers. It's about standing and say, you know, that must be difficult. Discrimination must be difficult. And not saying, oh, but, oh, but, you know, but sure, look, you know, the way it is, you get very little sympathy really being a traveler in Ireland. As travelers in Ireland, it's, it's the most acceptable form of racism in Irish society, the way we treat travelers. Um, and that's again, it's the oppression. You know, it's the oppression. And you know, the oppression, it leads to disempowerment, it leads to discrimination. So we need again to start relearning and re-evaluating in terms of what we've been brought up to think. Okay, so there's staff of Carlo College. We went to the rally and we stood with the women of solidarity with the women of Ukraine. Um, and there were also people there from the Ukraine and felt very tearful that, first of all, that we had to be there. And secondly, that nobody is asking for this war. And secondly, that people in Ireland do care that much, that they are standing in solidarity. And everyone is touched by what is happening. Everyone is touched by it. And of course, we have all of the images that we're, it's constant um, and it's, it's very, very difficult. But it's not even the people of, you know, women of Ukraine, it's families of Ukraine, it's, it's families in Russia, it's women of Russia, you know, who want to get out uh, also. You know, it's women and men, are, Russian men and women who are here, who are trying to get their families out and how difficult that is. So, you know, it's, it's all about that. And I, I hear it, it's already starting in terms of, you know, the Russians, the Russians, the Russians. Do you see a movie one long time ago, the Russians are coming. It's an old black and white, I think. The Russians are coming. <laughs> and that's, that's the, you know, the joke of it all. So we need to, again, stand in solidarity with, with people, whether they're men or women. But again, there's evidence always to suggest that it is the women who suffer, always the women who suffer, who are left holding it. There again, um, we have a student here from and our registrar as well from Carlo College. That was uh, Christina, that was uh, Christina Doyle there. About two days after the invasion, um, Christina from Lithuania felt very, very strongly about this, being from um, Eastern Europe, said we have to do something, we have to do something. And of course, we organized a little rally in, um, in that's in Kilkenny. Um, again, CBS boys there from, from Kilkenny um, and people who really did they just really, really felt we have to do something. Of course, we could do nothing but stand in solidarity, but wave the flag. But at least we felt a little bit better about it. You know, we felt a bit better. And that's often the way. It's often, you know, it's about us feeling a little bit better that we're actually doing something. Um, and it's very hard not to do anything. So the ally continuum there. So we have apathetic, okay, so we have people that have no understanding of the issues. But worse, they don't want to understand the issues because it might mean shifting their mindset a little bit, you know, coming out of their comfort zone. Um, and they don't, they just don't care, just don't care. And then you come into the people who are, you know, teetering on becoming, you know, doing something. So, you know, knows the basic concepts, not active on behalf of self or others, but they're aware of what's happening. They're aware of what's happening in the world. And then you have the people who are active. And this I would put, um, you know, most of us, I would say, between awareness and active. They're well-informed, sharing and seeking diversity when asked, prompted. So oh, an, an openness there. And then, of course, an advocate. And that's where we all would like to see ourselves in a lot we would have a lot more, um, I suppose, harmony in the world if we were all advocates and if we all advocated for a group that may feel marginalized or oppressed. So committed, routinely and proactively championing inclusion. Okay, again, that's what we have to look in terms of Athena Swan. You know, how do we apply it? Okay, it's great, we got the bronze medal, but how now do we go, how do we go and start applying this? And that means changes and that means rethinking, re-evaluating, but that's what we have to do to get to a fair, more equal society. So starting point in allyship, we ask ourselves, so these are the questions we have to ask ourselves. How much space are we taking up in conversations, in rooms, you know? 
it's, it's very empowering to contribute in a room, okay? It's very empowering, you know, it's, you, you feel you've made a contribution or you've said something or your voice was heard or whatever. But if you leave that room, you think, well, who didn't speak? You know, so maybe we should devise a mechanism where we all, you know, are able to speak or have the opportunity to speak. How do we actively improve access to our meetings forums? Very important there as well. You know, are we hearing everyone's voice? You know, everyone's voice. How are our identities taking up space? So, for instance, there may have been a time in Irish society where whatever the priest said, you listened. Whatever the headmaster said, you listened. Whatever the professional that was there, you listened because they were the professionals and they knew, you know. And very often people of what was considered perhaps not professional, um, you know, they, they didn't really know what they were talking about. But we now at least have reached a place where we know we value experience. We have to value that experience. Okay, are we aware of our biases, um, you know, that's again, it, it, it takes thinking about what are our biases. Do we stereotype on the basis of our gender or on the basis of gender? You know, do, do we make these comments about men or women? You know, that's something that we, we might have to think about. And what are our assumptions and from where did they originate? Like, are we making assumptions about people? You know, are we making assumptions? And who are we leaving behind? Okay, who are we leaving behind? And that's important. See, so allyship really, it asks us, it requires us to question how good we are on inclusion. So what, what you can do. So be familiar with sexist language and the historical, political, and social realities of sexism, okay? So it's not just about the here and now, it's also about looking back and what triggers for many people because of the years and years and years and years of acute sexism that we've had in the world and continue to have in some parts of the world. Be, be aware of your own implicit biases. Research to learn, learn more about the history of the struggle in which you are participating, okay? And that's really important. I mean, I would advise everyone to watch uh, Suffragettes. It's, it's a movie, The Suffragettes. Really, really powerful in terms of what women had to do to gain some kind of recognition. Okay, um, reflect and acknowledge how you participate in, in, in oppressive systems. Are you also, do you also have that internalized oppression? Reflect on the system and work with other allies to change the oppressive system. Okay, because it's very often the systems that are oppressive. Individuals, of course, create the systems, but we allow that as well. We allow that. Amplify the, amplify the voices of those without your privilege, and this is key to being an ally. You know, we all have privilege, we all have leverage somewhere. And learn how to listen, to listen, really important, and accept criticism with grace, even if it's uncomfortable. And this, that last one is really important because after the Ashleen Murphy horrendous murder, you know, people were talking about it and it was horrendous, absolutely horrendous. Um, but very often the conversation got around to, but it's not all men. You know, it's not all men. We know that's a given, it's not all men. But don't sidetrack the issue here. We're talking about creating a fairer society or a, a, um, a safer society. So the, to deflect all of the time, uh, for instance, it was said to me very recently, what about International Men's Day? Now that person who said that to me probably didn't know me too well because the look in my face, <laughs> You know, um, by the way, there is an International Men's Day. It's November. So I think us women now should get together and organize the International Men's Day. Wouldn't that be good? Um, so there is a, there, no, to, so, so, <laughs> nearly is laughing. So it is, it can be uncomfortable. It can be uncomfortable if you're a male and you're listening to people complain about men and how men can be aggressive. It can be. It's uncomfortable, but it's only uncomfortable. How does it feel if you're a woman and you're walking down the street and you don't feel safe? It's more than uncomfortable. 
Okay, so I think again, it's about question and not deflecting, not deflecting all of the time. Because if you deflect too much, really you could be maybe accused of being misogynistic, meaning, you know, don't really like women that much, you know, I'll put up with them, don't really like them. Um, so what you should not do, okay? So do not expect to be taught or shown, you know? Take it upon yourself to use the tools around you to learn and answer your questions, okay? So some men will say, well, you just tell me what to do. Just tell me and I'll do it. Whatever, whatever keeps you happy, you know? You're in fierce platform. Tell me what I should do and I will, I'll do it. Mary Judy, you're laughing. <laughs> I get that all the time. You're in the first platform. What do you want me to do? <laughs> and I'm thinking, ah, 27 years of marriage. What do you think? <laughs> okay. So do not allow yourself or others to deflect the issues. Okay. And I've talked about this deflecting all the time. Do not behave as though you know best. Okay. And that's very often, you know, the expert can come in there very, very quickly. Mm, yes, yes, well, I know about this now because I've read about it, you know. Um, do not expect to take credit for gains that have been made. Say we need to do more. And that's what I'm saying is now, you know, you can, people can say, oh, we've done this and we've done that and we've done that, you know. We've put more female toilets in Croke Park. Isn't that fantastic? But we need more toilets. It takes longer for a girl to go to a toilet than it does a boy. So we need more toilets so we don't miss the second half of the game. You know, that's, that's the reality. Come on in. And sit down. Make yourself comfortable. So, so we need to do more. That's, our, that's where we need to. We need to do more. So it's not just saying, but sure, look, we've done this and we've done that. You know, but so what, what more can we do? And do not assume that every member of an assumed marginalized group feels, not feels oppressed. Not every woman feels oppressed. Okay? So we don't assume, oh, you're a woman, so you feel oppressed. You know, or you're a migrant, or you feel oppressed, or you're black, so that you must face racism every single day. How is it for you? You know, it must be really difficult to be black. You know, do not assume that people feel these oppressions because we have to take it on an individual basis all of the time. So these are the phases that are not helpful. So if you're using these phases, you need to rethink. I know what I'm talking about, okay? Meaning, really, I'm dismissing you, really, because you don't know what you're talking about. Sort it out among yourselves. So that could be, you know, I would get it all the time when I was growing up. I had six, I have six brothers, and we fought. Oh, you wouldn't believe the fighting. And my mother would say, sort it out among yourselves. And of course, because I was a girl, um, I didn't have the same physical ability as the boys. <laughs> and sorting it out among... And, <laughs> And I, you know what I could say? Maybe that's why I'm here today. <laughs> because I did sort it out. We had to sort it out. But that can be very disempowering if there's a situation where, you know, one person feels that they're being bullied. Um, and then someone will refuse to take that on. So we'll go off now, sort it out among yourselves. You know, that's dismissive. Okay. Um, oh, I don't see it that way. Therefore, it doesn't really happen. Okay, because you're being dismissed. Um, that doesn't happen to me. Well, that never happened to me. Never. So really what it's saying that it doesn't exist. Um, I read somewhere that that's all a myth. Okay, so women feel oppressed. Oh, I read somewhere that that's all a myth. Sure. Women now are the ones that are in control. Ask any young fella. Sure, young fellas don't know what to do these days. All of this, all of that. Um, it was just a joke, get that. He can't take a joke. That's what we get a lot of time. Um, are, are you mad to think like that? Now, of course, if you're going to talk, call a woman mad, that's a trigger. <laughs> Be very, very careful. You do not call any woman mad, okay? Ever. <laughs> or you're overacting, overreacting. You're far too sensitive. You're like all women. You're far too sensitive, you know? And that, again, is oppressive, okay? Or you've got it all wrong, meaning you've been dismissed again. 
and that was uh, that was not my intent. You misunderstood me. You, know, you misunderstood me. So you know, really, it's your problem because you didn't hear what I was saying properly. You misunderstood me. Okay. So these are the helpful phrases. So you take note here now. That sounds really difficult. Do you want to talk more about that? Okay. Or your feelings matter. This is your reality. So if you're feeling bullied, you're feeling bullied. It's your reality. And whoever you're talking to about that has to take that on board, you know, because it's not about the person who is the perpetrator. It's about the person who feels bullied. Um, I can tell you a very upset. Let's talk more about this and see what we can come up with. Okay. I can see, I see you have been hurt by his, her, my actions. Okay. And I'm so, I'm so sorry. This is not acceptable. So these are helpful phrases. Okay. So this is what we really need to change our language because sometimes, you know, we go on the defense immediately and we say, oh no, you got it all wrong. Oh no, no, that's not, no, you don't, no, that's not the way it is at all. Sure, you're, you're mad to think like that, you know. Okay, so there's the Allies Toolkit. So we have, have patience, be willing to learn, confront your own biases, correct your mistakes. Sometimes it's admit your mistakes, go back and say, look, I was wrong. I jumped on the gun there. You know, I really shouldn't have. Keep an open-minded and an, uh, an open-minded heart. Check your privilege. And hello, it's not about me, you know. Um, and lift up marginalized voices, and that can be women or it can be LGBTQIA. And speak up to straight cis friends and family. Listen more than you talk. Okay, that is really important. Listen, listen, listen. And it's active listening. There's a difference between listening and um, reading active listening okay so again this is where I want you to I'm just about at the end of it here so what I want you to do this is a very small book and it's been around for quite a long time um, Shimon Zada Dada there and then Gosi Adichie a Nigerian feminist wonderful 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 I have put a link on the um, I have put the YouTube link, or the, not the YouTube, uh, TED Talk link. Um, really, really important. And uh, just about her feelings in terms of um, being a woman. Okay. Um, and there's, there it is, the TED Talk there. You watch, the, this is your homework, your Oberawalia. So you watch, um, you watch that if you, you should, I think we all should. Um, and then the moment of lift there, Melinda Gates, empowering women, women uh, changes the world, okay? So it is like, we cannot make progress if half the people of the world are held back, you know? And that is, and that's not that women or men are actually, you know, the lasso kind of around them and pulling them back. It's about internalized oppression also, because women can also keep women back. And that's another lecture on another day, but women can also keep women back. But that a lot has to do with internalized oppression there. Um, and then, uh, you know, Malala there, um, wonderful woman as well. So, Gurmaikot, and thank you very much for listening to me. It has been a privilege um, to be here, to have someone listen to me. Isn't it just great? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephanie, for that powerful lecture. Question uh, from the audience. What can men do to reduce the oppression of women? Okay, so that's Tom asked me, what can men do? I'll just hold this, is that okay? What can men do? Um, well, I'd rephrase that. What can we do? What can everybody do to reduce the oppression? Okay, what can we all do to create a safer, more equal society? So I'll, I'll, I'll start with men first, perhaps. I think what men can do is the need to have the conversation first with themselves. I need, they need to find a space where they can have conversations with each other. They need to call out their peers, um, their friends, in terms of any behavior or language um, or anything that has been shared on you know, social media that puts women 
in a very inferior position um, and perhaps uh, makes them feel that they can never be seen in public again. And I'm talking about uh, revenge porn and all of those, those awful, horrendous things that happen. Um, men obviously have a huge part in this, you know, a huge part. We're not going to move forward unless we bring men as well. We have to, we have to listen to men. You know, we don't, so if, if people say, well, men are the problem, why would you leave the problem outside? Bring in the problem and talk to the problem if you think men are the problem. You know, I don't necessarily think men are the problem, but I think we need to have that conversation. We're, we haven't been great in Ireland about having those difficult conversations. Um, we tend to, and this probably be, comes from a kind of a post-colonial era or state or you know state that we're in we tend to laugh things off very very quickly you know it's all funny you know and we don't have those serious conversations so i think what men can do is you know come together find ways um, of inclusion and that's inclusion for men as well and of course some men can say but yeah men do suffer violence but who's who's perpetrating that violence who's perpetrating the violence it's other men so you know and we, I, we do of course have people that men that are in domestic violence situations but i'm not going to do what i said i wouldn't do is deflect again we're here talking about oppression it's on the eve of international women's day and we all have a part to play we all have brothers we all have partners we all have you know we're, we all have students uh we have people in our community that we need to have those perhaps maybe not difficult conversations because we might not feel equipped to do that but at least be able to say come on now you can't be saying that you shouldn't say that that's inappropriate and every ga rugby club every every site where there are both boys and girls need to have this training you need, they really do need to have it and i think we'll be a better society for that okay tom Yes. So um, I'm going to hand you back to Tom now because we are going to raise some flags. I think Tom is going to talk to you about that. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Stephanie, um, for that thought-provoking and wonderful lecture. At, at the cutting edge, really, of thinking in this field of allyship. And that's the great thing about working in Carroll College, that our lecturers are at the cutting edge in their respective fields, and that each, and that at each of these live stream lectures, you always hear something new, something you didn't know, something that broadens your perspective, something that opens your mind a little bit further. And this is what we here at Carlow College, a liberal college of the arts, humanities and social studies in the center of Carlow town, bring to our students. Um, so thank you all for joining us today via live stream and in person. Do email us and we'll be happy to follow up with you on any aspect of this. Immediate uh, future events here will be celebrating a decade of the Carlow College uh, Literary Awards. If you're not familiar with our third level courses, do check us out on the Carlow College website. Thanks to Nerly Duffy and to Orla Nicontilla for keeping us online for these live streamed lectures. Um, that concludes this meeting and now we're going to raise two flags, the International Women's Day flag and the Ukrainian flag at the front door of Carlow College. So thank you all for joining us for Stephanie McDermott's lecture today. Slána Gwyb Galea.